Brian Streeter is with us. He's the editor of Conservative Home USA. Conservativehome.com is the website. Ryan, welcome to the program. Thanks, Tom. So, uh, you, you wrote this piece, Five Questions for Liberals Who Pretend to Be Poor Families' Best Friends, But in Reality Are Their Worst Enemies. And, uh, you know, you, you raise five questions. I'm not sure we have time for all five, but one of them, for example, how is protecting teachers' unions and resisting education reform good for poor children? Right? You raised that question. Right. That's one, one of the questions. You got okay. it. Okay. Um, if a, my question to you is, if a war was not going well, would you blame the soldiers? No, if a war is not going well, you don't blame the soldiers. You blame the people who made the decision about how to engage in the war. Right. So and, why is um, it that the, the, the three countries, Finland, uh, Singapore, and Denmark, that massively outrank us in terms of educational outcomes, all three of them require that their teachers come from the top third of their teaching schools, and the average pay of their teachers is between one and a half and two and a half times the average the average income of the average worker in those countries. In other words, these are elite jobs, very highly paid jobs, mm -hmm. and these people are very highly respected. In fact, in South Korea, they didn't even call them teachers; they call them nation builders. Yeah, right. Well, you raise a good point, and I don't think there's anything in what I said there that says teachers shouldn't be uh, highly paid and that we shouldn't um, promote them and elevate their status in society. I think those are all good things. Um, unfortunately, I'm not really sure that's what the teachers' unions are typically in the business of doing. I think the, the main thing we're... I think that's absolutely what the teachers' unions are all about. They're, you know, fighting for, fighting for good, good educational standards and for you know, decent pay and benefits for people who are working their butts off in, in, in sometimes really frightening conditions. Well, they, they, do, they do those things that you just mentioned. Um, but I think that what we have to look at right now is just what's going on in our schools across the country. And what we've seen is that through decades of kind of doing what you've just talked about, sort of protecting the teachers' unions, that hasn't – you just, you just talked about the difference between us and Finland. I mean, who's been controlling the schools? Um, well, they're unionized and, in Finland. And, why are, and why, are, why are our outcomes the way they are? It's not the teachers' fault. I think what we're, we're lacking is – to go back to your sort of your military references is the kind of general leadership that we need. We need we need new tactics. We need new strategies. We need I think we need to just blow up the bureaucracy. You know, pardon the the expression, but but blow up the bureaucracies to allow radical experimentation and choice in schools. And by choice, I don't just mean vouchers. I mean all kinds of alternative learning environments. More charter schools, the better. Vouchers would be good. I think the ability for local school districts to experiment uh, in these ways is, is a great thing. But we've already done a lot of those things. What we've found and with, with uh, charter schools is that one of two things happens. Either A, when you compare charter schools with the same student uh, backgrounds and demographics as, as public schools, public schools almost always outrank them. And number two, that when we've tried vouchers, that what we, what we find is basically that we are subsidizing wealthy people and subsidizing private schools and subsidizing in particular religious education at, at the at, and and we are turning our our public schools into basically, you know, ghettos. And where, where have we experimented with these vouchers you're talking about? My, my understanding is there are there are several places where we have tried that, where, where you know, there are cities around the country that have that have tried vouchers. Yeah, they've generally been pretty isolated. Um, yeah, there had there, there hasn't been a huge, funded, widespread national funded. experiment of that, but but you know the 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 proponents of it. You know, I just it, it the it, none of this gets back to the point that I'm making, which is you know why don't we do what the teachers union are, is is saying we do, as the teachers union in Finland says. You know, let's let's elevate the status of our teachers. Let's pay them well. Let's give them the tools that they need. What you know. Ryan, our teachers were doing great in the 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, and 80s. And, you know, they were unionized then. They were well-paid then. They were actually making more, or at least at, the average wage. And now they're making, on general, at or less than the average wage, given the level of education that it requires to be a teacher. And, you know, what has changed? What has changed is that 30 years of Reaganomics has wiped out our middle class. And the number one predictor of the success of a kid in school is the economic status of his parents. Yeah, and I think, I think the, the, that's a good point. And I, I think that the reality, though, is over the last three, four decades, fewer of those dollars are actually getting into the classrooms anymore. I mean, we, we, spend, we spend a lot more on a lot of other things. 
Um, look, I like mean, our schools, our, our schools need need resources. That's that's for sure. But some of the highest per pupil spending in the country, and, and when you look at just districts compared to one another, are in the lowest performing areas. That's because they are the lowest performing districts. areas, and therefore you get when you when you've got areas that have massive poverty, lousy nutrition, uh, places where you have literally food deserts, where where people have to travel miles in, in order to find actually fresh fruits and vegetables, and you know kids are being raised in these environments where they're not even they're not even getting decent nutrition, you know, much less anything else. And then those kids get dumped into the school system. A lot of those kids get coded as learning disabled or as behind. You know, they weren't taught by their by their by, by their parents how to read things like that. And 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 this isn't just inner cities. You see the same thing in Appalachia. You see the same thing in some very very poor other communities around the country. And and as a consequence, you have to spend more for special education. So you know, it's not that that we're you know we put in more money and we get bad results is that the places where we're getting horrible results cost more well we're certainly spending a lot more in those places but that's my point you talked about these these poor kids having to be dumped in the school system i think that's the problem i think what what you need is is to really just energize the the experimentation and we haven't been trying these things very much we're only just getting started charters aren't even that old i'm, I'm we've been doing charter my, schools I'm, for 20 20 some odd years yeah, but we ha- we haven't we haven't developed a critical mass where I think we're really able to see exactly how they perform compared to the public schools. Um, there, I I know some of the studies that you cited earlier. There's some other studies that cite um, uh, get, paint a different picture, and I think what we're seeing around the schools is an explosion. I mean, around the country, we're seeing an explosion right now of interest in um, in experimenting with all kinds of forms of education. I think that's a good thing. Well, let's experiment family, within, within the context income. of of the belief that every child is entitled that it's a right to have a free public education the very best one possible right can we agree on that yeah let's agree on that and okay. then let's, let's so make then, it possible to experiment i'm standing about a mile right now from heron high school in indianapolis charter school it's only been around i think seven or eight years and it's ranked i think 27th on newsweek's list of high schools in the country right. uh, they take everyone that applies right they're a fantastic school they're one example you can find these in, in many places but the reason they're succeeding is because they've been freed of a lot of constraints to change but a lot of the a lot of the very very highly ranked schools are also just public schools as well they, they just happen to be in affluent areas uh, mm-hmm. it, you know, this, is, this is an inner city school. Um, it, about half of the kids come from the lowest quintile. Yeah. You're, you're looking. You're, you're looking at an inner city school. That Ryan, I'm sorry. I can't. I, you know, I can't debate one school with you that I don't have. I don't. I don't know anything about. But the the larger issue, I think we've covered it here, and we're out of time. Ryan Streeter, conservativehome.com. Thanks, Ryan.